you are most welcome back. I hope you got a chance to look at that video we just did on the uh, United States and uh, with the condition of the president in particular. Some quite interesting things there where we discussed the probability of uh, someone uh, getting complications and dying in different age groups. But coming on to the UK now, things seem to have plateaued off. Um, things were increasing, cases of COVID were increasing quite dramatically for a period of time, but now it seems to be levelling off. Now let's look at the data there. Now this is yesterday's increase, uh, as opposed to the day before, as opposed to the day before. Now of course we can't read too much into that. But uh, what's interesting is it, they don't seem to be dramatically going up in terms of officially tested, diagnosed cases. And the COVID Symptom Tracker app is giving around about 19 to 20,000 new cases per day, combining data from uh, symptom reporting and from testing. And this has been level now for um, a, good, uh, a good couple of weeks, I think, now. So it does seem to have leveled off. Check on it there. There's a whole article on it there. So we seem to have reached a bit of a plateau. Now, it's bad in that we're still getting a lot of new cases. I mean, nearly 20,000 new cases a day is not insignificant. But this exponential growth that we were frightened of and the, uh, the scientist and the doctor's press conference a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, were warning against, thankfully doesn't seem to have happened. And we'll look at why that might be, because this is the key thing, the infection drivers. Have we partly managed to control the infection drivers, which, which of course, is what we need to do? Um, so it's not gone away. There's still a lot of people who currently have symptoms. Getting on for a quarter of a million people currently symptomatic. But nearly 50% of the cases are coming from the under 30s. So this means that hospitalisation rates and admissions to intensive care are still relatively low. They're still there, but the growth in those is not carrying on either, which we were concerned about a few weeks ago when the hospitalisation seemed to be doubling every seven days. That trend does not continue. So again, we're getting a plateauing there, which is encouraging because the health services are not being overwhelmed. Nothing like it at the moment, in fact. And of course, if most cases are under 30, uh, well, half the cases are under, nearly half the cases are under 30, much less likely to be symptomatic, of course, which is good. Um, now, this regulation of people not allowed to social outside, outside their uh, household or support bubble is one strategy. And this is being imposed in particular parts of the country where there are particular increases in cases. So we're getting this targeted approach. Now, it's coming for a lot of criticism, but to me, it's a lot better than a blanket lockdown. And it's not a lockdown either. It's just saying households can't mix as well as this rule of six. That rhymes, doesn't it? Um, but that, 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 that's what we're doing. It does seem to make sense. Table service only, of course, 10 p.m. curfew for pubs. Only essential travel, particularly in these uh, most infected areas. So this rule where households can't mix outside their support bubbles, um, I think it was in these areas originally. So um, North Tyneside, South Tyneside. This is, this is all in the northeast of England. These are northeast of England areas. Then central Western England are these areas where these restrictions currently apply. And uh, also uh, these areas, more in the Midlands, where these regulations apply. So this is good because it means that the epidemiologists have identified that a lot of the spread is household mixing. One household mixing with another. So rather than saying you can't do anything, they've stopped the household mixing. They've made that more specific and for specific areas. So while we empathise with the people that are under the restrictions, it's never easy. But I must say, looking at it objectively, it does seem to make sense. Moving on to something that doesn't make sense, <laughs> unintentional link. Um, now, a British trial of vitamin D proved to be ineffective, uh, or, or, or is that the case? So the, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, uh, Man ha Matt Hancock uh, claim government experts ran unsuccessful trials of vitamin D. They didn't. Uh, he got it wrong. Um, so he misspoke, which is fair enough. Anyone can mis misspeak. I do so many times. 
Uh, experts have for months been calling for ministers to look into the vitamin D effects. And apparently, Mr Hancock has now agreed to meet experts to hear growing case for the vitamin D, which we've looked at numerous times on this channel. Now, the reason I put this in is not because he misspoke. Anyone can misspeak. He, he can get it wrong. He's, he's got a lot on his mind. But what concerns me is that it was like dismissed a priori, um, it was like an axiomatic rejection of this idea. Now, Mr. Hancock, of course, is not a scientist, he's a politician. I think many more politicians should be scientists, but we haven't got that many politicians that are scientists, so we're stuck with a lot we've got. We've just got to make the best of it. But they should have the best scientific advice in the country. And the question is, is he getting the best scientific advice in the country? Because we've looked at the evidence of it in the I consider it overwhelming now. And yet that didn't seem to be anywhere near the front of his mind, which was, was my concern, really. That, uh, you know, you just wonder if there's some kind of subliminal messages that he was getting that he would dismiss that so quickly. Um, now, moving on to Europe, increasing cases pretty well all over Europe. Italy and Germany, not quite so bad. Uh, France, Spain, pretty terrible. So just as an example... France's health minister talking about Paris. If no improvement over the weekend, they'll go to maximum alert. All bars and restaurants may be ordered to close from Monday, a couple of days' time. Uh, and these areas are particularly uh, affected. Lyon, Lyon, Grenoble, Toulouse and Saint-Étienne uh, particularly affected in France. But it's many places in France. Just illustrating what's going on in Europe. Now, the next article I find absolutely fascinating. And I've no idea if you will or not. But it's to do with our long lost, long dead cousins, the Neanderthals. Now, the Neanderthals are named after the, the Neanderthal Valley in Germany, where the first one were discovered. And the last Neanderthal uh, hominid, human, whatever you, person, whatever you want to call them, died out about 35,000 years ago, and Gibraltar is probably the last one. So the story here is um, that humans moved out of Africa, early humans, what's called sometimes called Homo sapiens sapiens, the original humans moved out of Africa. They met these other group of earlier humans, who presumably migrated out of Africa early, uh, called uh, Neanderthals, Homo sapien Neanderthalis. And of course, as you would expect, there was... Um, exchanges of, uh, of uh, reproductive materials. Um, and what, what this means is that as humans migrated around the world from there, all the humans in the world, all humans in the world who were, were not left in Africa have got now got some Neanderthal genes. Not many, just a, maybe two, three percent in you and me. But the Chinese have got Neanderthal genes. The British have got Neanderthal genes. Um, the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Australian Aborigines have got Neanderthal genes. The only people that haven't are those that stayed in sub-Saharan Africa. So not a big percentage. Now, the people that stayed in sub-Saharan Africa, they, they've got uh, DNA contributions from other uh, archaic humans that no longer exist, almost, uh, almost certainly. But what it means is that people in, in Africa don't have Neanderthal genes, whereas the rest of us, according to the complete consensus of scientific opinion, do. And these Neanderthal genes have been conserved for this last 50,000 years since these breeding events took place because they have specific effects, and these effects can be good or bad. Now, if you're bored already, I do apologise, but I do find this interesting, and we'll see the relevance of it now. Neanderthal genes increase risk of serious COVID-19. So if you're listening to me now and you are not a, uh, your lineage is not long-term African, then you have Neanderthal genes. Not many, but some, according to all the current data. A lot of it's from the Max, Planting, Max Planck Institute in Germany, and uh, the scientific rigour there is, is quite uh, extreme. So the COVID-19 host genetics initiative. So what this initiative is looking at is, okay, some people get COVID-19 worse than others. Is that partly for genetic reasons? That, that's what they're looking at. So in all, in all disease conditions, the, the, the person can be affected by exogenous factors, 
like smoke or environmental pollutants or trauma that can affect the health of the individual from the outside or by uh, endogenous factors that, that come from within the individual and they're primarily related to their genetics so that's what this is about nature or nurture isn't it that's that's kind of the debate is this nature or nurture which of course is a long-standing debate in uh, in biology and in psychology and in everything else you care to mention um, right. Um, so the major the, the major genetic risk for severe COVID nineteen is inherited from Neanderthals. Fascinating. And we've looked and racked our brains on this channel as to why, thankfully, so thankfully, the infection fatality rate in Africa seems to be so low. And we've looked at quite a lot of reasons for that. Is it the malaria? Is it the uh, the young demographic, which of course it partly is? Is it the fact that they have a lot of other uh, parasitic diseases which boost the immune system and activate and sensitise the immune system in many ways? Is it the sunshine? Is it the vitamin D? What is it? Or is there a genetic factor as well? And this is saying that there seems to be a genetic factor as well. So it seems that the rest of us have got a predisposition to getting severe COVID as a result of Neanderthal genes, whereas people in Africa who don't have Neanderthal genes don't have the same predisposition. Interesting. Let's look at the evidence. Now, this is a genetic association study. So, OK, it's an association. You, you can't demonstrate absolute causality. There's a gene cluster, apparently, that I've got from Neanderthals on chromosome 3. A risk locus for respiratory failure of, of, of SARS coronavirus 2 infection. A locus is the part of the chromosome where the genes are located. And this is based on a study of 3,200 3, hospital patients that they looked at. So the ones that got sicker had more Neanderthal genes. The ones that got less sick had less Neanderthal genes. Now, that doesn't mean to say these genes have been bad. They've probably served essential immunological functions throughout the last 50,000 years of human development. But now the carrier risk for this particular disease state is, is the argument that this paper is making. Uh, so risk factor for severe coronavirus, two infection and hospitalisation. If you've got these genes, you're more likely to get more severe infection. You're more likely to die. Conferred by a genome segment of about 50 kilobases, 50,000 bases of these ATCG letters. Anyway, I didn't even go to the genetics now, but this is the nature of the DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid. Anyway, the, the ones that risk associated with inherited from Neanderthals are associated with increased risk. Now, approximately 50% of people in South Asia, particularly uh, Bangladesh, have got a lot of these genes. In Europeans, um, only about 16% of people have got these genes. So that does raise concerns about the potential infection fatality rate in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, which we do still await more data on. So um, sorry about a lot of background information there, but particularly interesting. I mean, it's like, you know, things like uh, diabetes and, and red hair may well come from Neanderthal genes. It's all it's all remarkably interesting uh, human anthropology, biological anthropology. Now, moving on to the Germans and fresh air. Now, I didn't know this, but apparent German culture is very much into fresh air, whereas in England we're always closing the windows, but the Germans like fresh air. So Germans embrace fresh air to ward off coronavirus, is the news article. And Angela Merkel, no less, says ventilation may be one of the cheapest and most effective ways of containing the virus. And of course, she's absolutely right. And you and me know why. It's because it dilutes the viral load. We all know this blows it out right this is this is Angela Merkel speaking it may be one of the cheapest and most effective ways of uh, containing the spread of the virus which you can't see there you are so that's Angela Merkel herself has said that direct quote because it's in italics uh, the German government has said regular impact of ventilation in all private all private and public rooms can considerably reduce the danger of infection now if you know anything about the German government it doesn't open its mouth and let its belly rumble. If this is what it's saying, this is based on good science. Now, apparently, German scholars and German citizens, of course, will correct me. But I think this is right. 
I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. All I can do in German is order beer and chips. You know, oh, and sausage, of course. Um, anyway, th 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 that means uh, ventilation. That's the German word for ventilation. Uh, I recognise the Luften bit from the air. Anyway, uh, ventilation. Whereas that word, apparently a separate word, means cross-ventilation. Now, German speakers, do feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, I apologise. But this cross-ventilation means you open a window on that side, you open a window on that side, and you get a wind blowing through. And the Germans have a special word for that cross-ventilation, which, of course, is exactly what we need to blow the air out, reduce the viral load. Why? 90% of COVID-19 patients pick up the virus indoors, where the viral load is highest. That is a profound statement. Only 10% get it outdoors. 90% contract this indoors. This is the importance of ventilation. As we've stressed so many times on the channel, as you're sick of me complaining, I go to shops in England here and the ventilation is terrible. 90% of infections are contracted indoors. It makes perfect sense, as you would expect from the German authorities. Uh, this guy is some sort of a air engineer uh, at uh, Technical University of Berlin. Um, I can't remember his title now. It's something like aerodynamics and a guy who knows exactly how air flows around rooms expert type of person. And he says this, even before coronavirus, uh, there is a clear evidence that uh, the air quality in offices correlates with the number of days workers are off sick. If you're in an office, you want to have less people off sick, open the windows. It's that simple. Even... Even before COVID, it was that simple. And in the German schools, they're airing the classrooms every 20 minutes. If that means it's a bit cold, fine, put on a thermal vest, but do it. And likewise, in New York, this article here from uh, The Guardian, I'd still prefer to be outdoors, about New York City restaurants. Um, they've got uh, uh, plexiglass partitions, ultraviolet light to kill the viruses in the air and on surfaces. They've improved ventilation. They're still only working at 25% capacity. Um, but that's the key thing. They've improved ventilation, so we'll give that a bigger tick. Um, but people apparently in New York are still reluctant to go back and eat indoors. But with good ventilation, I would be much happier than with bad ventilation. And just on a separate note there, New York, the positivity cases are going up to 1.93%. That means uh, this data is about 48 hours old now, but what this means is that of um, 100 uh, antigen tests that are done in New York, nearly two are coming back positive, indicating there is more community transmission going on, which of course is very disappointing. Now, um, this is from uh, Silvio in Brazil. So there's two uh, municipalities in Brazil uh, which have adopted the vitamin D administration against COVID-19. As far as I know, they've had no ICU hospitalizations from COVID-19 so far. They are being advised by this chap who's a big advocate of vitamin D. Now, I did look for this and uh, didn't find any publications on it, so I can't comment. I can just give you the email as I've been sent it, uh, the comment as it's been sent. But interesting that <clears throat> the vitamin D story does seem to be getting out in South America. And finally, uh, yesterday, I got this comment. There was a question posed at the beginning of the video that is never answered. So what I said at the beginning of the video was about 50% of people have uh, T cells that are cross-reactive against COVID-19. So given that 50% or more of people already seem to have a degree of immunity to COVID-19, why are so many people suffering from it? And just to clarify the answer, is the T cells, the naive T cells, need vitamin D to mature into active mature T cells that are uh, cytotoxic and can kill virally infected cells. So at the start of the video, I, I posed the question is, if 50% of or more people have cross immunity, they have these T cells that have cross immunity to SARS coronavirus 2, why is the prevalence of the disease so high? And one answer could be that the people who have these T cells in immature form, the T cells are not able to mature to the active immunological T cells because they don't have enough vitamin D to convert from the naive cells into the active virus destroying cells that they have the potential to be if the vitamin D is around. So apologies for my lack of clarity yesterday. 
Okay, that's uh, that's us for today. Thank you for watching as always. <laughs>